give us a cricket opinion that you can't say out loud i guess i think rohit should still be the mumbai indian captain i think if you're the indian t20 captain you have to be captain in your franchise do you remember a drunk conversation that you had with your england mates about the indian team we were drunk all the time so we were probably speaking about sachin what do you make of sachin's statue he deserves it <laughs> yeah but do you think it looks like him or steve smith the bat skewed in his hands he only ever played the most perfect drive what's it like being in mumbai covering the ipl but i look at the ipl i think for a franchise to win you've got to have your indian players playing well and you look at rajasthan yasif swijas fell at the top of the order yuzi chahal yuzi chahal i mean he doesn't really get much of a mention but i never understood why rcb got rid of him kohli and rohit sharma both they've created this identity of the indian cricket team virat kohli he has given so much love and joy to test match cricket and and when he was the test match captain i just felt that indirina in a real safe place and obviously ms dhoni in the white ball game you know hardik's being hated upon a lot and by a lot of indian fans hardik's going through a difficult time and and it's not his fault now he's been asked to come back to the mumbai indians uh, he's been asked to be the captain who's going to say no to that He's brash, he's beautiful. He's the former English cricket team captain for the first time on a podcast. These cricket podcasts are the ones I look forward to the most because I get to talk to them as a fan and not an expert. I get to learn from them and I get them to express the things they may not express within the realms of traditional news media. It's Michael Vaughn with our IPL special on the Ranveer show. Michael Vaughn I finally get to speak with you. I'm so excited to talk to you. I'm I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> What's it like being in Mumbai covering the IPL every year? Oh, I I I love the IPL. I mean it's uh it's the the biggest most flamboyant franchise league in the world. It's uh obviously got millions of eyeballs on it. Uh billions of dollars involved. Uh commercial brands desperate to get involved. Uh, high-end business people desperate to be involved. Every single player in the world desperate to get that uh, contract with one of the franchises um but I have to say I just love being in Mumbai I I I I adored Mumbai for years but I just find a bit of peace here you know I just like coming here I I call it my reset come and do some cricket talk about the game watch the games um I have a couple of weeks off alcohol which <laughs> is a good thing um I just l- enjoy the people I just uh, I like all the smiles I, I love the fact that they're obsessed with cricket you know they play cricket everywhere gully cricket i'm always stopping in a taxi just to to see kids playing the game and um i just find the people so endearing um and that's away from cricket they're obviously all cricket fanatics but uh, i just find the smiles on the faces so endearing and uh, there's a lesson there for many around the world that uh, you know a lot of these kids particularly in mumbai they don't have a great deal they have uh, very little compared to a lot of the kids back in the uk but they all seem so happy you know they're not fighting over an iphone um they're not fighting over the next uh, drop of a supreme hoodie or the next drop of a an air jordan uh, they just seem so happy to be out there playing um mainly playing cricket which is great for me i love i love watching them all play cricket but i just like to see them all so happy and it's uh, something that i think um many kids around the world can take a leaf out of you know that during the ipl it's probably the happiest phase for every single indian guy for sure who watches cricket the ipl is like a escapism uh it's become an escapism over the years uh, have you ever wondered about how life would have been if the ipl was around when you were playing cricket and captaining england because that's how all of us remember you with that <laughs> red and blue jersey that particular team uh andrew flintoff uh Harmison uh I think James Anderson had just started out yeah. uh, around that time you were right after Nasir Hussain that's right so, yeah so uh I'm sure you know this but there's a lot of love for you now that you've retired I'm sure there wasn't too much love for you back then uh <laughs> Indians take the India England rivalry a little seriously well I I think as a as an an England player there's there's two teams that you want to compete against and do well against and first and foremost not disrespecting india it's australia you know the ashes is is uh principally what we're about in, in english cricket to try and win those ashes back uh, so first of all when you want to do well against australia and then obviously it's india you know playing well against that indian side was always a 
a big goal of mine. Um, I have to say, I, I used to find the battles with the Indian side led by Sarav Ganguly, uh, always enjoyable, always hard fought, always uh, played in the right fashion. Uh, I remember Sarav getting his shirt off at Lords and <laughs> celebrating because Andrew Flintoff had come to, I think it was in Mumbai where Freddie yeah. got a wicket. And Light blue jersey. Shirt. Yeah, he got his shirt off and uh, I think Sarav was... Uh, Kind of replying to that a few years later at Lords in a one-day game, um, yeah. So it's always fierce. I, I must admit, I had a huge amount of admiration for the way that Sarav Ganguly captained. And when I got the captaincy of England in two thousand and three, I tried to take a, a little bit of everything that I'd seen from captains and also um, captains that I'd played under back at Yorkshire. Uh, obviously, with Nasser Hussain it, with England, Alex Stewart captain a couple of times as well. And also, I used to watch the overseas captains, how they operated. And Sarav Gouli was, was one of those captains that I looked at. I thought, oh, yeah, that passion that he brings. You, know, mm. you have to have passion as a mm. captain. And then I looked at Steve Waugh. He was tough. You, know, you <laughs> have to have a bit of toughness about you. Uh, Stephen Fleming in New Zealand. I watched the way that he tactically maneuvered his um, troops and the way that he managed people. I uh, wanted to take a little bit of that. Um, I, I actually look back at my career and think, how did I end up as captain? <laughs> I don't see myself as a leader. You seemed like the most stable guy in that English team. And I'm not demeaning the other guys. They were all dynamites. So that's at least from a cricket fan's perspective. I thought to myself, you know, why did they pick Michael Vaughan as captain? It, you brought a lot of stability. That's what you, you felt like the big brother in the room. Yeah, yeah, m maybe. Um, yeah, I would say they were incredible players. Though. I mean, to to have those kind of players, you know, Steve Harmison bowling 90 miles an hour, Simon Jones, very similar. Matthew Hoggard, well, he was a character. <laughs> he was mad, but then Freddie Flint's off, Kevin Peterson, Tris Darren Gothic. Goff. Darren Goff was finishing when I started. But, you know, real characters of the game. And, you know, I always believe in, in any sport, uh, in particular cricket, that we, we seem to have a lot of characters that you, you've got to allow them to be characters. You know, that's, I, I believe, the job of the leader of, of the team and the, the management group is, you know, you don't want to take that character away from someone. Mm. You know, if they are a, a flamboyant personality, if they are a little bit outspoken, let them be that. You know, it might might trigger them into playing better. If you try and take away their, their key um, kind of principle, character, uh, you know, you might just take away something that brings them out as better people, better cricketers. So I just wanted them to be themselves. And uh, I guess a few of them are a little bit different and a bit wild and wacky at times. But, um, you know, as I said before, I, I, I look back now, you know, I'm getting 50 this year and I look back and think, I don't see myself as a leader. I, I, you know, people say, oh, you were this great leader of the England Cricket Team. I honestly just felt that I was just going about my business as normal and trying to get people to play cricket um, in a way that I enjoyed watching them. You know, I, I generally believe that we want to enjoy watching players play. So when you're the captain and you're sat on the balcony watching, you know, I wanted to enjoy Freddie Flint off trying to whack it out the ground. That's mm. what he was good at. Are you in touch with him now? No, yeah, yeah, you listen to me, and he's obviously it's great to see him back in the game. He's uh, he's going to be the coach of one of the teams in the hundred ball competition, which is great. He's gone through a, a real trauma with the accident that he had on Top Gear, and he's trying to fight through that. So it's great to see him back involved in cricket. His two lads play. Yeah, his two boys are coming through. Are really good players. Are, are they also all rounders? All rounders. Yeah. Oh, really? So get ready. Yeah, India, get ready in a few years' time. There'll be a couple <laughs> of Flintoffs coming at you. Flintoff was one of the local favourites here. Like we hated him at that point. And then over time, you began to respect, love, adore Freddie Flintoff. And then I think he was also the most expensive player in That's one right. of the player auctions. Yeah, that was with Kevin Peterson. They both, I think they both went for exactly the same yeah. number. Freddie Flintoff, I think, you, you remember him from 2005. But, you know, I honestly think from my time playing, when he was bowling at his best, and that was around two, four, five, and six, I, I think he, were, he really was a great bowler. His numbers yeah. don't do him, um, you know, don't do the... The, the kind of bowler that he was and the cricket that he was, you look at his averages, they, they certainly don't do him justice. You know, he was a, a wonderful bowler. Cricket fans miss that kind of an all-rounder. You know, the ferocious bowler. I mean, we have it in Ben Stokes, but Flintoff was Flintoff. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you look around the world now, Cameron Green is he's, he's just setting out on that all-rounder journey. He, he's got the potential to be a, an incredible all-rounder. Look at Hardik Pandya. Mm. You know, he's had injuries, but again, he's uh, he's in the news for the wrong reasons at the minute about his captaincy yeah. and should he be the captain? I just see him as a player. and I, I look at Hardy and think, Phew, I'd want him in my team. Yeah. You know, give me a Hardik Pandya every single day of the week. I have to ask you about Hardik Pandya and Rohit Sharma. 
but i got to finish this loop of freddy flintoff because uh, he spoken about with a lot of love within the indian fan base mm. uh, what was he like in the dressing room and maybe the wider question here is what makes uh it possible for a country to produce all rounders because england has constantly produced all rounders you don't see that in other country australia a little bit india it's like we've only got hardik pandya uh since kapil dev so yeah. what's the difference in like english culture why did you all produce freddy flintoff and ben stokes and sam karan uh and freddy flintoff's kids yeah yeah i mean i i you talking seam ball and all rounders i mean I, i think you've got the best all rounder in the world here at the minute in ravi jadeja i think he's an incredible cricketer but he bowls spin um i don't know i mean i guess our conditions you know when you're growing up in in, in english conditions you don't bowl much spin the pitches are wet <laughs> bit of green the ball swinging around why would you bowl spin so i i guess people when they're younger kind of just align to bowl with a bit of pace and obviously if you in the modern era you've got to try and whack it out the ground that's a, an all-rounder and unless uh, you're a ingredient. brown unless you're a brown guy growing up in england then you want to be a spin off of the england team yeah if you can be yeah <laughs> if, if you can be but i would say our conditions aren't conducive to try right. to produce world class spinners yeah. uh, we've had a couple in, in in the past but that's the, the biggest thing in english cricket is trying trying to produce a spinner if, if you could give us a ravage deja uh, we'll we'll pay a lot of money for him if if, if he's for sale mm. um but you know i think all-rounders what they bring and if you look at you know a lot of cricket teams in the in the history of the game generally they've, they've been a good team when they've had an all-rounder mm. it just makes your job as a captain so much easier for the balance of the side you know getting five bowlers you've got your five bowlers because you're all-rounder it's going to bat at six bowl your 15 20 overs a day um you know the, the generally the all-rounder is that charismatic person that kind of galvanizes the whole team we've had it in Ben Stokes uh, Freddie Flintoff Ian Botham mm. three very similar characters I mean I don't know about Ian Botham I don't know about Ben Stokes I've not been in the dressing room with them I mean you'd probably be surprised Freddie Flintoff is quite quiet Oh really Yeah he's very insular yeah so he he wouldn't be loud in the dressing room he'd be sat in the corner reads a lot of books Now again you wouldn't you wouldn't think that Freddie <laughs> was the type to he's very intellectual um it do a crossword and and read books in the dressing room he wasn't one for speaking too much he, he wasn't the noisiest in the room uh he certainly wasn't as noisy as someone like Matthew Hoggard who was always making noises but um yeah very in a way quite insecure at times you know and i think when he went out onto the cricket field that that was his space you know that's when he felt that he could just be him and he could play this aggressive game and um as i said when he was at his best he was a, a tremendous cricketer i'm assuming that if insecurity is an inherent part of a human being and if they're willing to work hard then they eventually achieve greatness that's probably why he became an all-rounder in the first place yeah and i think people forget and i think sometimes i forget as a pundit that you know you're talking about human beings you know they have emotions they have thoughts and um you know i think most most people have a bit of anxiety mm-hmm. about performing you know when you're going over to you know if you're on a stage i'm sure actors have that that anxiety or oh, am i going to perform well tonight and it's exactly the same in sport that you know cricket is a and particularly now where they're playing you know pretty much 12 months of the year and the pressure is on you know with social media um every game that they play now is is streamed whether it's live on television or streamed on youtube you know that's back to county cricket ranji trophy everything is seen now and if you make a mistake or if you do something really well everyone's going to see it you know so there's nothing really in the middle you're either being seen for doing something remarkably well getting a 100 getting a 5 for taking a catch or you're seen for doing something remarkably bad mm. dropping a catch getting out consistently bowling a bad over uh, so everyone sees everything these days which you know I have a huge amount of admiration for all sports people because um they're in an era where we as the fan can tell that sports person what we think we can go on social media and we can tell that person exactly what we think of their performance i never had that you know we we, we might have had the odd phone in radio show mm. where the fan could ring oh my god boy's useless he keeps dropping <laughs> catches and i go i agree <laughs> <laughs> certainly agree whereas now the fan can have that communication through to the player and and i guess he sees and i would say to all that modern sports people you know don't look at social media when you know you've done something uh, wrong or bad or not quite performs to the level that you like, don't look at it. Yeah. I know it's easy for me to say but just try and switch it off. You know, come back on when you've scored a 100 or got a fifer. I don't understand why you trigger your mind into such negativity by looking at the comment section of social media. If you if you're going to go on social media, just go on 
mentions, you know, just mm. have a, not sorry, just put your, your X out there or your comment and then don't look at what people think. You know exactly what you're thinking at that time. Why would you want to trigger a, a huge amount of people who are clearly, you know, the sports fan is quite a passionate fan. Mm. <laughs> they're not interested in a, in a normal day. They're, they're interested in when you've done really well or when you've done really badly and they want to let you know. They'll either say you've done brilliant or they don't say, oh, do you know what? I thought you were okay today. That's not a tweet. That's mm. not an X. Mm. You know, it's either going to be really critical or really praising. So when you know you've had a really bad time of it, put it away. Which is why we love Riyan Parag right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, what a player. I mean, uh, you know, so he was spoken about with high regard throughout the years, but because he had a difficult last two years combined with him, uh, I think he was showcasing his confidence and I get that uh, I was the same at that age. He was just trying to uh, manifest something for himself. Mm. He got trolled very heavily by the meme world in India. And generally, I think the Indian cricket fan base is even more passionate mm. along with the Pakistani cricket fan base. So now that he's taking off, he's actually enjoying himself. I hope he's enjoying himself or he's just come out a really stoic person. Yeah, well, he's got a great opportunity with Rajasthan because... They're a tremendous franchise. They obviously won that first one back in the day. We showed him Warren the late great, a uh, good friend of ours. Um, and you're looking at Rajasthan, you look at them last year, they started well and then they dropped off towards the back end. But I, 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 the IPL is intriguing to me because generally the IPL, it gets all this exposure for the the big books that they play, pay for all the overseas players. You know, it gets huge headlines. And when it's auction time, everyone stops and it's, they were all waiting, you know, Mitchell Stark went for a huge amount. Pat Cummins went for a huge amount. You mentioned Freddie Flintoff, Kevin Peterson back in the day. But I look at the IPL, I think for a franchise to win, you've got to have your Indian players playing well. Yeah. They have to play well. And you look at Rajasthan, Yasif Swijas fell at the top of the order. Yuzi Ashwin. Incredible young player. Incredible yeah. young player. He's got many, many years of yeah. domination ahead of him. Did, you did look, you... Sanju Sampson, he can play. Yeah. You go Parag. Ashwin, Chahar, you're starting to think of the core of that Rajasthan team. And the reason why they've won the early stages of this year, it's not to do with Joss Butler, it's not been to do with Hetmeyer. Uh, Trent Bolt's had a couple of good spells, but it's to do with the Indian core. And that's why I think that Rajasthan are a real threat this year. That Indian core can continue to play well. Uh, they've got a great chance of doing something special. Yeah. Uh, while the auctions are going on, do players in England also get very excited? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're keeping a track of the auction. Oh, yeah. I mean, Sam Curran, he, he went for a huge amount last year. He's uh, on big books this year. Um, Does it make headlines there? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Absolutely. Harry Brook went for a big big number last year and then he was put back in the auction. Didn't get quite the amount this year and pulled out. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's always big news. And the, the talk leading into the, the auction is oh, who's going to go for what? Who's going to be the big ticket? What are each franchise looking for? Um you want to be that all rounder, you know, that all. I think if you asked me, could I come back and play again? I'd want to bowl 95 miles an hour <laughs> and bat left handed and try and launch it out the ground like Nicholas Puran. Mm. I think that kind of player. So, bowl, if, if I could bowl like Bumrah <laughs> and bat like Nicholas Puran left handed, uh, that would be worth a huge amount of money. That's the prototype that we create on cricket video games. That's <laughs> yeah. the same prototype. That That's what you creates. want to come out. If you could build, I guess in AI days, which you are in, <laughs> if you're going to build a cricketer um, with all this tech that you can, I think AI will be trying to work on a, a Bumra style poor and cricketer. Who creates runouts like Jadeja. Correct. Yeah. And, <laughs> and throw either hand. And maybe keep a bit like Dhoni as well if it gets bored. Mm. Practically speaking though, what happens while you're growing up in order to become a cricketer? And that's the question I, that I have about all-rounders as well. Maybe it's kind of related to Hardik Pandya. I've always wondered about why India's only seen one Hardik Pandya mm. uh, and one Kapil Dev and almost no one in between. Mm. Is it because you have a limited amount of fuel as a human being to invest in these skills? Like why can't everyone become the prototype that you just spoke about? I, I think in... I, I think most cricketers, particularly in the UK now, they all want to try everything. And that's exactly how you, sh you should treat your early days as a player. Um, I've never understood a batter not being able to bowl. And if you go back to India when they won the World Cup in 2011, most of that top six could all bowl. Yeah. Uvi, Sewag, they could just bowl a few overs. If you look at India's top six now, none of the batters really bowl. And I think it really affects India in white ball cricket because as a captain, you want as many options as possible. 
And even if it's just two overs here, three overs there, it just uh, it makes your equation down the back end of an innings that much easier. India at the minute in white ball cricket, they have five bowling options. So if you you know as an opposition, I'm playing against you, hit one of them. Mm. Smack one of them to all pots, then they really are struggling because that one ball has been smacked, but he still has to bowl 10 overs or he still has to bowl four overs in T20 cricket. You can't just throw in a Sawag or a UV mm. just to see it or a Sachin, Sachin bowl, seam, leg spin, off spin. You know, I think that all cricketers that are coming up playing the game, if you're an outstanding young batter, the coaches should say, right, you can bat and you're going to be a great batter, but by the way, you're going to have to bowl. Got to bowl because it's going to help your team. It's going to help the captain and it's going to help your team win more trophies in the future. If you can get all your young batters um, just bowling something, you know, something of a variable, just anything that they possibly can. I just think it makes you into a better team. From the perspective of a batsman, it's probably slightly confusing to face someone who doesn't bowl often. Is that the overarching point? Here? Well, I, I look at someone like Glenn Maxwell. Glenn Maxwell, incredible batter. His offspin is very clever because he can think like the batter. Mm, that's and what it is. And because he um, plays all the tricks and, the, and all the remarkable shots, he's as good as anybody in this era in white ball cricket. I think when he runs up to bowl, he can see what the batter's thinking and he can bowl the ball, which is the hardest ball for the batter to hit because he knows what the batter's thinking. Mm. You know, so I've always thought in white ball, Joe Root's a very good bowler because he knows what the batter's thinking. Um, it's not just that, you know, bowlers who are just out and out bowlers, clearly they're, a, they're the standout. But I think there's a, a huge role in the game for the batters who bowl. I just think they think exactly what the batters uh, think and they can just, just bowl something that's harder to hit. You know what I want to do right now? I want to create a time machine, go back to Rohit Sharma's childhood, tell him to focus on bowling and make him take Travis Head's a wicket in that <laughs> World Cup final. <laughs> That's what my heart. I didn't think saying. you were going to mention the World Cup fast. See, you've got your shirt on. <laughs> As always, <laughs> irrespective of everything. November the 19th. Where were you? Uh, I was right here, actually. Yeah. I, I didn't want to go to the stadium because, I don't know, I, I kind of almost felt too nervous to go. There was a part of me that was nervous. Mm. In retrospect, it was probably the right decision. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was painful. I was yeah. watching it with my grandfather. And we were building this core memory of watching a great cricket match together. And now it's not a core memory anymore. We've just erased nah, it. Unfortunately, the Australians did what the Australians do. They win. <laughs> <laughs> they, know, Sucks. they know how to get over the line. It's, uh, it's an amazing mentality that they have. They just know how to get the job done. Ah, um, I feel like Kohli and Rohit Sharma both They've created this identity of the Indian cricket team. Like even in the lead up to the final, the kind of ferocity that our team was playing with was crazy. And I feel this is the outcome of their careers and their mentalities. Mm -hmm. But my real question to you is, is this Indian bias speaking? Like what is it like from your perspective as a non-Indian seeing this team? And the other question is, what was Ganguly's team like from your eyes? What's the commonalities and differences? Oh, Sarah is... Um team is very team it was collectively hard I felt that he got them all playing together as a team really well and uh, obviously when you've got the likes of Dravid and, and Sachin say I get the top of the order uh, Gautam Gambier is coming through you know real quality player Sarav himself was a wonderful player so he, he had quality Zaya Khan magnificent left armour and then you had Harbijan and Anil Kumble you've got quality in your team so um, yeah they were hard to beat you know I think he made Indian cricket really tough I, I look at you know, a few individuals within um, the Indian ranks that have made them into this this powerhouse now. And, and I will say this, and I've said it publicly recently, India should win a lot more trophies. We agree. <laughs> I, 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 I can't get the fruit. 2013, I think, was the last trophy in ICC. Yeah. Champions, Champions Trophy. trophy. That, that's not a trophy, really. The, <laughs> that is a trophy, Michael. No, it's, it's like the World Cups and the, the test champion in two chess, uh, championship finals, lost them both. And I'm just looking at the, the amount of talent in this country and mm. I looked at Rohit in the in the World Cup and I, I had so much admiration for Rohit because he got them playing properly yeah he got them playing absolutely fantastically you know the, the modern way the aggressive way he did everything right just had that one blip in the final that can happen but Rohit's done a tr re remarkable job but I, and, and he's an individual I mentioned about getting the team playing collectively in this aggressive way uh, and he's led from the front with that uh, Sarav Ganguly back in the day he he made India hard made them tough Virat Kohli he has given so much love and joy to Test Match cricket and, and when he was the Test Match captain 
I, I just felt that Inder in a in a real safe place, and the world game was in a in a safe place when Virat was captain because he's so passionate about Test match cricket. I mean, those wins in Australia. All right, the second one, he he went home having I think it was a thirty six all out, and then he disappears yeah. and India win the series. But that's his team with Ravi Shastri. They they create an incredible incredible mindset for Test match cricket, and obviously MS Dhoni in the white ball game, no one. No one's been better than MS behind the stumps, captain in a team. So they're the four individuals that, that I'll mention that are, have really transcended Indian cricket. Virat's fitness. You know, his, his attitude to an, an ethic to fitness, um, driving forward day in, day out, just having that mindset of getting out there and playing. Um, it's it, it must be kind of the rest of the younger players around the whole of India looking at, oh, I want to be Virat. I want to kind of follow his lead. And, you know, fielding has become a a thing, whereas I, I guess back in my day, India were never renowned yeah. as being a good fielding side where you look at them now, they're, they're electric. Yeah. You know, today's just probably the best in the world. Back then, it was just Yuvraj Singh and Mohamed Kef. Yeah, and, and it was out the the norm, wasn't it? Oh, God, you've got a couple of fields that can run. Mm. That's remarkable. Whereas now, I think through Virat, I think the whole of Indian cricket realizes you've got to be fit, you've got to be fast. Um, but I, I just look at them and think they should be winning a trophy every two or three. Yeah, you know, every two or three trophies that are available, India should be winning. In your eyes, as a former national captain, what's going wrong, and specifically what went wrong in November? Because this was our best chance. Yeah, it was, and and I no, they they dominated the whole World Cup. You know, I don't think they can play any better. And then on a final against Australia. Uh, you, you sometimes have to give an opposing team a huge amount of credit. And Pat Cummins, uh, I say team, but also an individual. I thought Pat Cummins was a, a genius that week. The way that he spoke to the press, said he wants to quiet the Ahmedabad crowd down. Um, won the toss, decided to bowl. Again, it was a tactical genius move. Uh, put the squeeze on. Didn't allow Kale, Rahul and Virat to settle. Kept on swapping bowlers either end. Then he bowls the ball to get rid of Virat Kohli. Um, he led that team as well as I've seen an individual lead, lead, lead a, a team in a big, big game uh, in my time watching the game. And he just has, you know, that Australian mentality. You know, they, 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 they're they not scared. You know, when it gets to the big moment, they're not scared. And and that's going to be the challenge for India now is that, you know, they, you know, done okay. They obviously got to the top of the tree in terms of the test uh, championship, but have not won the finals, lost the final in November. Um, it's getting over the line, you know, winning, winning a trophy. It's it's not easy. It's it it doesn't sound, and don't don't say this the wrong way, but it's easy to get to the final when you're quality, but it's bloody hard to win. Mm. It's really difficult to win a final, particularly when you haven't been used to winning finals of late. Do you think we lost because of that fear element? Psychology was a part of the loss. Uh, I I did feel that with the bat in hand, um, you know, row it was flying. You know, Rohit's dismissal was was key to that final because another half an hour of Rohit Sharma, maybe the other players that have followed, and he'd taken that that score a little bit deeper. Um, you know, his dismissal was 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 key to that that Indian batting. And were they fearful? I I actually felt they probably thought that the score that they got was going to be okay, but then the pitch flattened out. The the dew came in, and obviously Travis had played a blinder. But I wouldn't say they were they were scared. I wouldn't say they were playing in a fashion that was kind of mentally weak. I wouldn't say that. I just thought that Australia had a had a little bit of a, a stronger mentality on the day. And India, if you were being ultra critical, could probably have been a bit riskier with the bat in hand. Yeah. You watch football as well, right? You know what noodle hair Ronaldo is? <laughs> it's like when he had golden dye in his hair and that's his best season for Real Madrid. So there's noodle hair Ronaldo and there's the knockout version of Hardik. Hardik <laughs> in the knockouts. I think we needed that as well. That yeah, day. yeah. We oh. needed that one extra guy. And, um, you know, Hardik's being hated upon a lot and by a lot of Indian fans. I personally understand that people are upset. I get why people are upset, but I think it's unfair uh, simply based on how much he's performed for India in these tournaments over the years. He's always that guy who stood up even in that innings that Virat Kohli played at the MCG against Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Hardik Pandey was at the other end for most of that innings. So people tend to forget these aspects of cricket, but I personally really feel like we were missing a hard dig that day. Yeah, absolutely. You had to key all around. I mean, Hardy's going through a difficult time and, and it's not his fault. 
you know, he's been asked to come back to the Mumbai Indians. Uh, he's been asked to be the captain. Um, who's going to say no to that? <laughs> he's just been given a job that pretty much every single cricketer in India would like to do, is captain the Mumbai Indians. They've had a, a tricky couple of years. Um, I just think the communication's not been quite right. And I think if they had the time again, they'd probably communicate it a little bit better. Um, I personally would have kept Rohit. You know, I think Hardik coming back to Mumbai is, is big enough pressure in itself. And Rohit, once he had a good World Cup and he's obviously going to be the Indian T20 captain, the sensible move, sensible move would have been for Rohit to carry on as a Mumbai Indians with, with Hardik in mind for next year or the year after. He's always going to be around the Mumbai Indians now. Um, but what I don't get is I, I don't understand booing. I kind of get it the first game at Gujarat. I get that because he played for them for two years, did so so well with them. Uh, and, and their fans are bound to give him. It's a bit like the pantomime, isn't it? It's bound to happen. But when he went to uh, Hyderabad, I thought, what's going on? And then he comes back to the Wankhede Stadium and, and his own supporters were booing him at the toss. I, I, I didn't understand that. And what Indian cricket and the Indian cricket fans have to understand, and the Mumbai Indians are Indian fans, for India to win the T20 World Cup, I think they need Hardik Pandya. Yeah. They need him. They need him playing well. So they need to, over the next few weeks, somehow get that confidence level right up to the top once again because India with Hardik flying, you know, have got a great chance of lifting that trophy. Like I keep saying, they should be winning trophies, but I don't think they will unless they have a Hardik Pandya playing well, you know, unless they have a Rishabh Pant playing well. So they're two cricketers that I'll mention. For India to win the T20 World Cup, I think Rishabh has to play and he has to be playing to a level that he was before his injury. And he's kind of getting back to that level now, but he's still got a a few kind of uh, cogs to go up and they need Hardik Panya, the all-rounder. And maybe Yuzi Chahal. Yuzi Chahal, I mean, he doesn't really get much of a mention. Yeah. And I don't understand why. I, I never understood why RCB got rid of him. No How the did. RCB side? I mean, the RCB bowling for years has been shocking. And yet the one bowler that is always delivered is you, and they let him go. I you don't know, quite understand that. Um, I'm going to say something that one is allowed to say in the world of podcasts. Uh, RCB is a very well-branded team and the chatter in cricket circles is that they pick players who are great for branding hmm. but not match winners and they've actually <clears throat> like why would you let go of UZ Chahal who's become the all-time leading wicket it, there's no sense behind that move uh, it's probably not in Virat's hands mm -hmm. that's my reading of it from the outside and that's how a lot of cricketers also look at it mm -hmm. so RCB is going to continuously not win trophies because of uh, how the management is going about their job mm -hmm. Uh according to a lot of cricket fans at least yeah. we don't see them winning trophies because and, and you know you you see a lot of franchises in the IPL yeah. constantly doing badly yeah. so there's something that's going wrong on the management level it's not up to the players yeah well I, I, the RCB have never won so what 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 I like about the fact that the RCB have won it, it proves to me that team sport is not just about individuals you know so you can go and buy all the biggest individual names and put them into a put them into a team doesn't mean you're going to win and it's been proven at, at the RCB that you know they've they've signed some incredible players and they have you know AB de Villiers, Virat, Glenn Maxwell, Faf. Faf, unbelievable players but it just tells you unless you get the whole team operating and every single player knowing the roles and identifying different roles for different people and it might be that you have to rejig your team slightly just to allow someone else to fl flourish in a different position I don't see the RCB side doing that. I, I look at them this year, actually. I think pretty much every opposition when Virat goes out to open, the, they open the ball and we left arm spin. I get that because Virat, you put two fields on the onside boundary. You might get away with a couple of singles. Uh, before you know it, you've had one over and three or four off it. Perfect start for the field inside. I wonder if the RCB seed, I thought, well, okay, they're going to open with a left arm spinner. We need to open with a left hander. And Virat will not one off the first. But then you've got a left hander facing the left arm spinner and he launches it into the Stand a couple of times. Then you get to 13 or 15 off the first over. I don't see them trying anything, you know, different. I just see them thinking that, and it's probably wrong, but it, from, again, it's perception. They just seem to think because they're, they're great players in, in this team that the management think, well, we've got great players, we're going to win. It proves to me that even though you've got great players, unless you get the team ethic, the culture, and you absolutely identify everyone's roles perfectly, um, you, you're not going to win trophies. I mean, traditionally, there's been only two beautiful things about their franchise. Virat Kohli <laughs> and their jerseys. And nice. now there's only one beautiful thing because the jerseys are shit this year. <laughs> 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 it's a horrible jersey. Why would you... Why does every team go for a red 
and or blue jersey. That's it. Like it, it, the Sunrisers <laughs> kit this year. That that's awful as well. <laughs> That's an, that's an awful <laughs> kit, yeah? Awful <laughs> kit. Gujarat there, my favorite. Gujarat, Mumbai. Yeah. Do you like remember it. the Deccan Chargers kit yeah. back in the day? The navy blue. Nice. Yeah. Nice, right? Memorable. Rajasthan, that's a good kit. The pink kit, I yeah. like that. Yeah. At, at least they're trying something new. That's what mm. I like about Rajasthan. Mm. I mean, I think in the Indian billionaires who buy these teams are not very uh, savvy when it comes to branding. Like, honestly... I hate the name Lucknow Super Giants <laughs> and I hate the branding. Why would you just have a cricket bat with like those wings? There's so much more you can do with Lucknow. <laughs> it, it's just weird branding. They're like, quite a good team though. They're a great team. Mm. I think they've almost become almost become my second team because they're exciting to watch. Well, I'll tell you why they're exciting this year because they've got a young 21-year-old ball 157 oh. kilometers an hour in, yeah. in mind. Yeah, have his, uh injured last year. He's come obviously into the, the team this year. Wow. That's all I can say. Wow, he's got a, a very, very bright future. We had Umran Malik come out some time ago. Just the fact that he could bowl beyond 150 or touch 150 was a huge deal. Now we have Mayank Yadav. Yeah. So I don't know what's happening within Indian cricket, but it's Well, great. then you add to that, you've got Mohamed Shami, who's obviously injured at the minute, but he'll come back. Uh, Mohamed Siraj, um, Jasprit Bumrah. Yeah. And I think Jasprit, if, if, if you're asking most people around the world, if you could pick one fast bowler for all conditions, all formats, Bumrah's Bumrah? number one on the team sheet. Yeah, he's just, um, he's incredible. He's a goat fast bowler. Yeah, he is. In India, right? There's not been, probably Zahir Khan, Javagal Srinath, Kapil Dev. Mm -hmm. They're in that next rung and that's saying mm -hmm. something. Bumrah's yeah, but there's there's some world-class bowlers. Or, you know, in, you know, New Zealand, Trent Bolt, uh, Tim Thal has been great for many years. Jimmy Anderson, Stuart Broad, uh, incredible bowlers. Pat Cummins, Hazelwood, Stark, incredible. But Bumrah's just, <laughs> he's just a, a little bit, he's just got that that action, that release. Because of his release, he gets a little bit closer to the batter, which is obviously um, giving him that extra bit of pace, uh, accuracy, reverse swing, conventional swing, variations, bounces, you name it. bumrah has got absolutely everything. From your playing days, you'd faced Vaseem Akram, Vakar yeah. Yunus, Glenn Magra, all these guys. Steve Harmison, also, I remember his prime, it was something crazy, James Anderson. Mm. Where would you rate Bumrah amongst this lot? Oh, I, I I just look at his action and and I would say that it, it, he would be the one that I wouldn't want to face out of all those names that you've mentioned. Really? Yeah, just his action. It's just uh, and all the players that face him, they say it just hits you. It's like a bowling machine. Just mm. thud, it just comes out at you. And I think from ball one as well, he doesn't really give you too many looseners. That that first ball is is always on the money. It's always a, a similar pace to his last ball. Um, yeah, I mean, Wazim Akram was a genius. Absolute genius, um, Glenn McGrath. If there if there was any movement, he'd find it. Uh, if there was a length to hit, he'd, he'd find it. You know, he, he knew exactly uh, how to restrict you. He studied your technique. He knew how to make you keep very very uncomfortable. But predator. I just yeah yeah. When that Australian team were was just a group <laughs> of they were hounds, weren't you? They mm. came after you. Um, yeah, Bumer. I'd have Bumer pretty much at the top of that list. When you were playing. Who was the bowler that you were afraid to face? But there was an element of fear. Well, I ne never feared. Um, I feared getting out. You know, I wasn't worried about getting hurt. Um, you know, Muralitha in, in Sri Lanka when, you know, you've got uh, Sankara behind the stumps, Mahela at slip. You'd have many around the back giving you a load of stick and Murali spinning either way. No clue which way it was spinning. You just hope that you guessed. Um, yeah, he made it very, very difficult. Warney, obviously, and, you know, in, in any condition, but particularly when the ball was spinning. Um, yeah, and Glenn McGraw, when Sean Pollock and Glenn McGraw, when the ball was moving and there was not so much swing, because I think swing, you can see swing early as a batter and you can play swing. See movement, you've got no clue. You've no idea which way it's going to be. You've got an idea that they're trying to seem it away or they're trying to seem it back. But, you know, this, you know, they talk about the waddle, wobble seam in this year, you know, when the ball wobbles down and thought, oh, this is a, a new thing for this last six or seven years. Well, if you look at Sean Pollock, Sean Pollock always wobbled the ball down. It went in, it went out. Uh, Glenn McGraw, very similar. Um, yeah, so seam movement was always, and all batters will say the same, seam movement is so much harder to face than swing. What about spin for you? Like, which one was more difficult for you? Um, no, I didn't mind facing uh, spin. You know, I, I I enjoyed the challenge. I think I think in, in cricket, fa facing or watching someone uh, bowl, 150 kilometers an hour it's a great spectacle but there's something magic about a spinner 
you know, a Shane Warne bowling a spell or a Harbisiana Cumble. Um, you know, you look at Graham Swan for England when he mm. was getting it going and and the ball's spinning. You just know that as a batter, you, you just a uh, one little small mistake and you're gone. You're gone. You're out of there. And they get one wicket and guess what? The new batter coming in, it's a nightmare. Mm. One mistake. <laughs> and you see spinners get... <laughs> You know, you, particularly in India, you know, if you look at the last series that England England have just lost 4-1. As soon as Ashwin got win with one wicket, you felt, oh, there's another one coming. And another mm. Kuldeep Yadav, who I have to say looks like the most improved bowler in the world. He's just uh, developed that pace and that drift and that, that consistency that he possibly didn't have a, a couple of years ago. So whoever's worked on his action and he's probably strengthened his body to be able to bowl a bit quicker for longer. Um, I think Kuldeep, Kuldeep's going to have one of those spells one of those spells that he might start to dominate both home and away for, for India. Mm. Um, for the amateur Indian cricket fan, if our team's traveling to England, we look at it as a test for a lot of our youngsters and our test cricket players who've performed well here. And over the years, on an average, we almost always anticipate that we're going to lose a lot of wickets very quickly in a few of those matches at least. Now, I personally believe that any human being is an outcome of his or her own stories and experiences. Mm. So you white boys in England, what <laughs> what happens to you guys when y'all are facing seam bowling constantly in those conditions? Are you able to play seam bowling, fast bowling better than the subcontinent players? Like what happens to subcontinent players when they're playing in English conditions? Like, can you break it down a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, we're, we're brought up with the ball swinging. You know, from the age of four or five, when you play the ball swings through the air, so you're kind of used to that ball swing. I don't, know if that's the case here in India you're probably used to the ball going straight uh, maybe a bit of reverse swing and obviously spin mm. so your your game is geared towards that um, so naturally we're, we're our, our, our techniques our mindset is is fine when the ball's moving around and I guess it's the, the opposite when England come here to India and the ball starts spinning, spinning around we're in a little bit of panic stations and I think over the time there's been some um, wonderful players that's been that like England have produced. Um, Kevin Peterson, I think, uh, Triscothic, Graham Gooch, they're the kind of standout players of, of of how to play spin in terms of a defensive mechanism and also being able to counter attack and, and put the spinners under pressure. And that's the key. And it's the same when you're facing seam and swing in the UK. If you go there with the mindset of just defending and trying to see the bowlers off, these juke balls that you use, in the, they generally swing all the time. Mm. They're always moving. So you have to learn a mindset and a technique to try and make sure that you, you rotate in the strike or at least trying to put the bowler back under pressure. If you allow Jimmy Anderson just to bowl, in England, he'll get you out. So you have to have a, have a, have a, have a tool somehow of, of forcing Jimmy onto the back foot. By, and it might be taking a risk. And again, here in India, I think there's times where you have to take risks against the spinners to try and put them on the back foot. And that is the, the key of any innings when you play here is that when you take the risk, what risk do you take? And if it comes off, you're generally okay. But it's that, that moment when you go, right, I've, I've got to try and put Ashwin under pressure or Harbijan or Kumble. Can't just, can't just sit in my bunker expecting mm. to score because they don't bowl many bad balls. So you have to try and force these great bowlers into doing something different. Um, and that, that I guess that's the gulf between being a good player and a, and a great player. You know, the great players have the tools to be able to put all the quality bowlers under pressure with 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 a movement or or a shot. And I think if you're just a good player, you don't quite have the tools in the box. So you have to work on your mindset being strong. Um, you have to have such a strong mentality for the pressure situation. Um, I admire all the players, players that have all the tools in the box. I kind of look and go, it's quite easy for you because you can kind of devise a way around any pressure situation. I had a huge amount of admiration for those that don't have all the tools in the box. Like, for example? Uh, I would look at someone in England, someone like Paul Collingwood. Oh. You know, back in the day, I thought he mm. maximised, you know, Graham Thorpe played a lot mm. with Graham Thorpe. He he was incredible at just maximising what he had. Um, you know, there's, there's there's been many players over... Many generations. Steve Waugh, I think you could probably put at the top of that list. That any any Indian players that you can think of? Oh, I've always looked at the Indian players and thought, oh, you've got talent. <laughs> <laughs> you've got a lot of talent. They can all play. Um, I do think when they come to the UK, they have this... Um, it's not fear, but I, I, I think they overplay the moving ball. Uh, I think they get into their minds that the ball moves a lot more than it actually does. You know, I look at India now in, in terms of the bowling, it's like Boom, Rashami, Siraj... They've got bowlers that are going to get 20 wickets in the UK. I guess back in the day, 
they probably didn't, but they certainly had the bowlers now to get 20 wickets. Um, so the batters don't have to look to get 500. For 300, 325 is usually a big score in, in, in English conditions. And I go back to the last tour. Um, in, in, India were winning that series. They were 2-1 up and then obviously Manchester happened. They disappeared back to the IPL. Uh, came back the following year for that one-off test, England winning. So it's a two-all series. So you you could argue that if they'd have played in Manchester with the momentum of the Indian side, they possibly would have won that series, which they probably deserved to do, uh, but they didn't finish off the series. Next year when they come, you know, they're up against Basball, this new style of play, which has just, you know, failed here in India. Uh, but it's a hard style to play against in England because mm. England know the, the dimensions of the ground. They know the pitches. So if India aren't going to do their homework in the next year and a half and think that they're just going to arrive in England and play to a similar standard to what they have done, uh, I think they'll get blown away. I really do. They, they, you have to do a lot of research playing against this England side. If you yeah. do that and are prepared to play in a certain fashion, look at Pat Cummins last year. They just hung in there. I don't know if, if the right kind of mechanism of success uh, with the way that Pat went about it. He went really defensive and spread the field. I'm not too sure you go about it all the time in that fashion, but there's certainly a lot of research required to play against basketball in the UK. I love speaking to English people in general. I think you guys have a crazy sense of humor. <laughs> okay. And I think Indians know this about English people when they interact with English people. Okay. Uh, now Here's a psychological input that I actually understood after speaking with Yuvraj Singh. Hmm. So he said that when he was playing you guys, he was a little more fired up. So I asked him why. So honestly, there's, there is this little rivalry that mm. uh, we feel with England only because of history. That's not a reflection of how we feel about you guys now. Right now, you guys are bros. Like, but <laughs> there's this like historical rivalry. Have you watched the movie Lagan? No. Have you heard of the movie Lagan? No. It's one of the most iconic Hindi films. Right. Okay. Go, go watch it when you're yeah. free. That is the perception of England from a competitive sports perspective that a lot of Indians have. Mm. Uh, so... I think Indian players get very switched on when they're playing England yeah. uh, and Australia. See, the number one rival is Pakistan. But in that second rung, it's probably England and Australia. Yeah, like, yeah. you really want to win. You never play Pakistan. Uh, that's true. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> I wish that could, I, I, that'd be... If you said to me, what, what, what would you love to see in the world game? I'd love to see test series regular Oof. between India and Pakistan. Yeah. And if it can't happen in India, it can't happen in Pakistan. Have it in Lords. I, have it in the UK. <laughs> Seriously, we'll host you. We'll sell out every ground. <laughs> but then we'll be playing to the strengths of the Pakistanis. Nah, India have got all those quick bowlers. Mm. India do not... This is my... I think Indian um, cricket fans and, and maybe some of... The, maybe the players still think that they haven't got the tool. They've got all the tools. They've got the best seam ball in attack, you could argue, with Australia in the world. Got world-class spinners. Got world-class batters. It's everything you require to win in England, in Australia. They've won in Australia the last two times. Mm. Hardly any teams go to Australia and compete, never mind wins. India, if you can win in Australia, you can certainly win in the UK, but it takes a, a huge amount of preparation and planning to do that. Michael Vaughan, say something that you can't say on traditional news media. <sighs> Give give us a cricket opinion that you can't say out loud. I I, I can say whatever I want on, <laughs> on, on any platform. Um, I I guess I think Rohit should still be the Mumbai Indian captain. I think if you're the Indian T20 captain, you have to be captain in your franchise. I just don't understand that. And that was where I said communication. It could have been easily sorted out. I think Rohit's a, an incredible leader. Another one. Just keep going for it. Keep going. Um, poor, you have to click makes here, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> uh, what What do you want me to say? I mean, I... I Who's an overrated cricketer in the modern day, according to you? Overrated? I don't know. I, I, I would say that England have got to be careful that they don't become a side that people love to see lose. You know, I think they've got to be careful. Some of their... their their interviews of late about Basball and you know some of the comments regarding the way that they play and it's you know it's the only way to play the game. I think they've got to be careful that the rest of the world aren't looking and going, "Oh, we hope you lose." So I think as a sporting team, you want to be uh, respected wherever you go, and you want people to actually really enjoy. I love watching England play. Mm -hmm. I have to say that I, I love watching them play. I just as want, you should. I just want them to be a bit smarter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just every now and again, I just want them to use their their brains and just play. Uh, aggressively when you can but also understand that 
you can dip down in the gears when it's not possible to be aggressive all the time. Yeah. In your eyes, as an English cricket fan, what went right to produce that golden generation that won the ODI World Cup? You know, the Ben Stokes World Cup. Preparation. You know, four years, 2015. You know, right back from, you know, that, that final we, we reached in the early 90s against Pakistan. From there, right through to 2016, we were shocking. In white ball cricket, absolutely garbage. And then obviously we we have a disaster in 2015 and then Owen Morgan, Trevor Bayes get together in 16 and they knew exactly what they were going to try and achieve in 2019. The World Cup was in England, so that helps. Uh, everything just fell into place, but they they deserved that element of fortune in the final because for, for three years, the way that they played, uh, buying into this aggressive brand, uh, bringing through all the right people in the right roles, um, yeah, you know, great players as well. But you know, going so aggressive at the top, Jason Roy, Johnny Bairstow, uh, Joe Root with the glue, um, Josh Butler just a freak. And you had the all rounder in Ben Stokes. You had spinners in Adil Rashid, uh, Moeen Ali. Then you had real quality seam bowling. You know, Liam Plunkett did a role. Uh, Chris Wokes obviously, and then the final piece of the jigsaw, Jofra Archer arrived. Mm. <laughs> it was all a line for England to win. But again, that's why I mentioned India, to win in England in a year and a half time, you've got to prepare. You've got to get everything right. You can't just arrive in England in a year and a half. Oh, we're playing in England. What are we going to do? And that's the admiration I had for Owen Morgan and Trevor Bass because they they worked on that over the course of three years. My disappointment actually is since then. You know, they won a T20 World Cup in um, in Australia, but our 50 overside from winning it in 2019, it's just kind of just Dipped. fallen. Yeah, they're... they're their defending of the, the title here in India was a poor defence. You know, selection was wrong. They just didn't play the right style. Uh, yeah. Just didn't play the, the standard of what we'd come uh, accustomed to. And I think, you know, great, great sporting teams. And I, you know, look at the West Indies back in the 80s, uh, the Invincible side back in whenever that was. Uh, Pakistan had a, a real quality side in the 90s. But, you know, the Australian side are, are the dominating team of our era, you know, the 90s, early 2000s, they won World Cups, they won Test Series in India, they won obviously the Ashes pretty much at every opportunity uh, and that's a great sporting team and I just felt England with, with everything that they had, they had a great chance with the team and the, the skill levels that they, they have of doing something incredible, of coming here to India and winning a World Cup, winning England, winning India, then you're a great team. Mm. You know, I think they missed that opportunity. And, and that's why I'll, I'll keep going back to India. They are the team that I look at now. I think Australia are a quality team, they, they, and they always are. But they, they have this mentality. It's just mentality with Australia. That's all it is. They are desperate to win, and they know how to win. I look at the talent here in India, and I, I, I think every single team in the world who said, oh, what, which talent pool do you want? And you can take any. You can buy any t- Everyone would say India. All the talent is in this country. Let's speak about James Anderson. You captained him. Mm. It's strange for me as a 30-year-old cricket fan to say that he's one of my earliest cricket memories and he's still playing. (laughs) So was there something special in him back then? Did you know that this guy's going to keep playing? Oh, no, no, absolutely not. When he first started, he he had that, I think he had blue hair. Then he turned (laughs) it to red. It might have been white at a time. And he bowled these big booming outswingers. You know, he didn't even look at the batter when he was bowling. Look at his, his action. He kind of dropped his head and he bowled these big, big outswingers to the right-hander. Um, then he got an injury and then he was out of the side. He, he wasn't a part of the 05 team. And then 2006, he didn't play. And then we went to New Zealand and then we got him and brought him to the side. They just, uh, I, I never, ever felt that either of them were going to go to the... The levels that they've achieved, it's remarkable. The longevity that they, they have given the game and um, you know, waking up as a batter every morning is hard. But waking up as a bowler, you imagine what the body's... I mean, <laughs> well, I have a look at his Jimmy. He can't, he can't like being at home because <laughs> well, he been. always wants to play cricket. And he said something actually, um, which I saw last week, which I, I think it's exactly the message that all kids have got to understand. He said to to be a cricketer, you've got to love fielding. So when he first started playing the game, I think it was at Burnley, Burnley Cricket Club, he was just the fielder, diving at square leg. He loves fielding. And again, I I, 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 I didn't like fielding. You know, I couldn't catch. So I was always worried in the field in case I dropped a ball and you know it was going to affect the team and the outcome of the match. And it's easy for those that are naturally gifted at fielding, you know, 
it's easy for them because they take catches and they're not worried about that. But someone that's actually is concerned about fielding because you might drop the ball that loses your team the match. You know, a lot of anxiety creeps in. You, you. I used to worry more about fielding than batting or, or bowling a couple of overs because I thought, oh God, I just can't catch. And if I drop that ball, that's the game over. I'm going to look mm. an absolute idiot. So that message by Jimmy was, was a perfect message for me for all kids that are starting out be good at fielding because if you're really good at fielding and you enjoy fielding, but it's, it's the one skill that you do more than any, 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 any of the others. So you might as well get good at fielding and it'll give you that longevity. I mean, you're seeing players now that uh, are playing longer than ever. They're fitter. They actually eat the right thing. I don't think they drink consistently. <laughs> Anyone knew <laughs> what was being drank in the old days, but I wouldn't change that. I loved it. Um, you know, there's this is opportunity now for a, a, I guess, a playing career. My day. If, you, if, you, if you've got 12 years out of your playing career, you've done well. I genuinely think these days there's a 20 year career there for the players if they look after themselves, uh, do the right thing. But you've got to be good at fielding. Do you remember a drunk conversation that you had with your England mates about the Indian team back then and perhaps Sachin Tendulkar? <laughs> <laughs> what did you all say when you all were drunk? <laughs> oh, jeez. We, we, we were drunk all the time. So we were probably speaking about Sachin more often than not. How would you get him out? No idea. Okay. Um, oh, we, 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 you know, I, I, you've got to remember, I, I came through the 80s and kind of the early 90s of what cricket was back then, you know, which was... You know, my, my father, when I made my first class debut at um, Yorkshire versus Lancashire, you know, I had six pints of lager the night before the game started. <laughs> but that was the norm. I batted on day one, I faced Wazim Akram, I got 60 odd. That night I had 10 pints. Nice. So I, I celebrated the fact with all my teammates, yes. you know, it was called my career best, which it was at that time. So I had to buy all my teammates a pint and then they all bought me one, which one or two disappeared, but we ended up having 10 pints. <laughs> that that was the norm. It, it wasn't that you were just celebrating. That was like every night of county cricket in the 90s, there was always a restaurant to go to, a pub. Uh, there'd be a quiz night somewhere. Um, yeah, I mean, particularly on a Saturday night when the, we used to play a 40-over game on the Sunday. And every Saturday night, it was called the Saturday Night Club. <laughs> and we would dress up in uh, toga outfits, uh, fancy dress. We'd have a team room full of piss. <laughs> And then go out at night. And then no wonder that my white ball game was shocking because <laughs> most of my my younger generation playing county cricket was played on a Sunday, hung over from the Saturday night. But those were the times that we played in. It's a real test of a great English cricketer, I guess. It's, it's not easy facing the likes of Wazi Makram on a Sunday when you've only had three hours kip. <laughs> And he's had coke the previous day. <laughs> Sorry, he's alleged, spoken about this. Alleged, alleged. Alleged. No, I think he's spoken about it on oh, one of the podcasts. <laughs> All the respect of Asim, sir. Uh, because I want him on the show. I have so many questions for the Pakistani legends. Oh, yeah, they're uh, a great, they're a great cricketing nation. Yeah. Oh, they fascinate me, actually. Because you can't ever predict what's going to happen. No, it's chaos. Yeah. But I always feel when there's chaos, beware. You know, beware because... They've won trophies in the past where they've arrived at the world. They've looked to shambles. Then suddenly they get on this kind of run and phew, they're a steam train. I look mm. at them now, but I mean, Babra was captain last year. He gets the captaincy taken off him. Didn't think he'd done a bad job in white ball cricket. It comes off him. It goes to Shaheen Shah Afridi. Uh, he then gets it taken off him. I don't think he got told, but he had quotes on the website. He then says, they're not my quotes. Babra's back as captain. Um Absolute chaos. Apparently getting a new coach, maybe one for the red ball, one for the white ball. Um, beware them in the T20 World Cup. Anything yeah. could happen. Honestly, the cricket fans who are not into geopolitics miss Pakistani cricketers in the IPL. And I yeah. think these are two separate domains. Yeah, I agree. Like imagine what the IPL would be with the Pakistani cricket. I, I honestly think, I mean, I've said it earlier, uh, the sooner the, the world game can get Pakistan playing India on a regular basis in test match cricket, uh, and as I said, wherever that may be, if it can't be here and it can't be in Pakistan, please, we'll have it all. Abu Dhabi, Dubai. I just think that is, you know, when, when India play Pakistan, I mean, I'm a big football fan as you are. You know, Man United play Liverpool. It's massive. It's monstrous. But there's nothing like India playing Pakistan. Yeah. India, Pakistan at cricket is, I think, the biggest watch sporting occasion in the planet. When it happens, the whole world stops. Everyone seems to want to watch. It goes into the billions of, of eyeballs watching that game. Um, and it'd be great for... Test cricket is the one format that we need to try and protect. 
make sure we're looking after. And I think what could look after it more than anything, you, you know, test championships, you know, going down to four days, day, night cricket, whatever it may be. I think one of the biggest tools that could help save test match cricket is that India play Pakistan on a regular basis. Is ODI cricket dead? I think it's the one format that could be put under pressure. Yeah, I mean, I, I enjoyed the World Cup. You know, I think while ever the, the World Cups are being played like we saw last year in India with, again, huge amount of eyeballs, TV likes it, uh, a huge amount of revenue through commerciality. What I think should happen is, yeah, a World Cup ha- happens every four years. I think the bilateral series are dead. Mm. You know, I think the the actual World Cup should happen every four years and leading into that World Cup, probably six months before, that's when you get back into the 50 over bilaterals as, as kind of warm-ups for the World Cup. Um, I guess people say, oh, but how do you qualify? <sighs> I, I would have a qualification um, amongst the lesser nations, if you like, or the the teams not in the top ten. Um, all the top ten teams should be playing every World Cup, um, you know. But it, one format has to give. You can't have all these franchise leagues. Test match cricket still um, flourishing like we want it to, uh, and fifty over bilateral. There's just, there's just not enough months in the yeah. year, so something has to give. And also bilateral T Twenty series. I don't I don't think they should happen. You mm. know, I think. You know, the franchise leagues, they, they're they almost like the old bilateral series. That's where you're going to pick your players from. They're under mm. a huge amount of pressure. The Pakistan Super League, obviously the IPL, the 100, the Big Bash. There's plenty of cricket there for the selectors to try and find your T20 international players. Um, as I said, something's got to give. And I just think bilateral, one day T20 cricket, got to yeah. give. Um You know, I mean, a dream scenario would be if cricket goes football style. And we have matches on the weekend throughout the year. And mm. there's some kind of an escapism to turn to throughout the year mm. rather than just these three epic months. Mm. Well, that, 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 that's at the IPL. So I, I think to save Test Cricket, I think that Test Cricket should have its own window. Yeah. And it should be, you know, I don't think you could, you could grab six months of the window. There's just too much happening. I think there's going to be a Champions League that's going to arrive. But if we said for, for three months every year, it was just Test Match Cricket time. So the whole world just plays test cricket. Which months depends on where we're going to be playing. So I know people say, oh, yeah, but where are you going to put it? Well, that's for the administrators to de- uh, to decide. But if we get the three months of the year where test cricket is played solely and everyone's just watching test cricket, talking about test match cricket, I just think it's going to be good. So there'll be, be no franchise leagues. You can't just suddenly nip off and play in Bangladesh or Sri Lanka or nip over to Australia. Now it's test match cricket time. And that, I think, would make a lot of players want to play test match cricket for longer. Mm. You know, do you want three months off? Some might say, yeah, they want three months off and they might decide upon those three months to be off. But I would say the majority of the great players in the world would be absolutely committed to those three months playing test match cricket. I think it'd be uh, a really good thing for the game. Michael Vaughan, this was the podcast for today. Uh, I could speak to you for hours. I love speaking to British brothers, but <laughs> thanks for being in our studio. Oh, thanks for having me. Lovely uh, room, by the way. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad you. Do like I it. get a little nod? In, uh, that's Virat, is it? Is it it's, Virat? It's Virat Kohli, Rohit Sharma, Rohit. MS Dhoni, and KL Rahul. Is that Rohit captain in or just being a player? <laughs> He's uh that's the that's that's the that's the captain version captain. of Rohit. Yeah. Maybe come, he needs to come back. <laughs> Hopefully within the Mumbai Indians itself, because today there's headlines all over the news where people are like, um, he's going to probably leave Mumbai Indians. They're gonna release him for the mega auction, mm. which I hate by the way. He's not I gonna think, gonna Chennai, you reckon? Replace Downey? I was just talking I mean, about this. Guy quite obviously doing it this year. Do you think that's kind of just a holding position for Maybe row it next year. I think that the franchises that have never had stability are going to go for him. SRH, Punjab Kings. Mm. Um, I'd argue Kolkata. They've not had that charismatic type captain yeah, they, since they Gambhir. Look this year. They look fantastic. Yeah. I think they're going to make the top four. Yeah, but uh, for the next phase, maybe Rohit Sharma is one of those row it. pillows. I see him in Chennai. That'd be heartbreaking, honestly. I, I see him there. For a Mumbai Indians fan, that's that's terrible. <laughs> I wouldn't mind him going to Hyderabad. He played for Deccan Chargers. That would be kind of romantic. Yeah. I wouldn't mind him going anywhere for his own joy and happiness because we care about him other than Chennai. <laughs> <laughs> All the so so, so, so if, he, if he went to captain Chennai 
and he came back to the Wankady, would he get booed? No, 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 never. Rowett will never get booed. No, no. I see. So he can play for Chennai. Yeah. No, Rowett's Ro- never going to get booed. He's yeah. in that legend status, but it would just hurt a lot of the Can I ask you fans. about um, what do you make of Sachin's statue? Well, I mean, he deserves it. <laughs> yeah, but do you think it looks like him or Steve Smith? Oh, this is the... Oh, there you go, Steve ah, Smith. Ah, cute. Yeah, it kind of yeah. looks like... Yeah, it looks a little bit more like Steve Smith. Yeah. It looks like Steve Smith and Sachin Tendulkar had a love child. Mm, but also the shot. Have you got the full frame of the shot that he's playing? Uh, zoom out, zoom out. Did Sachin play a drive like that? Look, the, the bat's <laughs> skewed in his hands. He only ever played the most perfect drive. Michael Bourne, it's all about the vibes. Mm. It's all about the vibes. Sachin needs a new statue. That's what I want to finish <laughs> on this podcast. I'm, I'm, I want that one taken down. And I want the great man, the master, to have a new statue. Yeah. I want his back to be straighter. Mm. And I want his top nice elbow a little bit higher. <laughs> and I don't want him leaning back. He never leant back when he drove the ball. He just went, you know, with a, a full transfer of weight. Um, yeah, so can we just make sure that that gets clear? I want him to have a new statue. Only if you go whoever, whoever made that statue, I don't know who it was, but I'm sure <laughs> someone will tell me, but um, I don't want them to make the next statue. <laughs> Have you seen the Ronaldo one? Yeah. In in uh, yeah. Portugal? Yeah. That's a fun statue. Yeah, that wasn't quite right. I think it was the same person that made that one. <laughs> no, I think the Ronaldo one's worse. <laughs> the Ronaldo one is like a homeless version of Ronaldo from another timeline. <laughs> uh, but, Michael Vaughan, I think we're out of time for today. Uh, you have to head back to the Crick Burst studio. Yes, yes. So, uh, we always love listening to Michael Vaughan, reading your tweets. Uh, you're a nice, brash young bloke so it was a lot of fun like speaking with you <laughs> uh it was always you you had a very positive presence that's how i remember mm. you from my childhood watching you like it was always very pleasant listening to you and <laughs> as a pundit i've really loved how direct you are because i think a lot of punditry especially on traditional television lacks that directness which is why i love what you guys do at quick mm. and i don't think too many fans tune into traditional tv anymore no, At just, least urban fans, for sure. Yeah, they like digital, don't they? It's the modern modern world. Yeah, so I hope to speak to you again. Perhaps the next time we'll speak about Love Manchester to. United. Uh, uh, well, I'm here for the World Cup, for the T20 World Cup. So okay. let's see uh, how your team get on. <laughs> you don't rate India? Uh, India? I, I rate them I rate them hugely. I, I, I'll keep saying it. They've got the best squad in the world. Do we have a chance at winning? Got, got a chance. Got I'll a think, chance. I think Australia will win. Do you see Rishabh Pant in the starting eleven? Yes. Okay. With that, uh, I'll put it this way. India are stupid if they don't have Rishabh Pant. A left-hander and Rinku Singh. Ooh. Yassi Sui, Rishabh, Rinku in that top seven somewhere with Jadeja as well. Mm. I think left-handers are very important in T20 cricket. Who's going to miss out? I think KL will miss out. I think it'll be Shubman or Virat. Probably Virat. Virat's just white ball specialist, brilliant tracer. Uh, like the way he's played for the RCB, I think he's played a bit more expansively. Um, and then Sky, Sky bats at number four. Rishabh five, Hardik, Rinku, Jadeja. Pretty good. Would you have Yuzi in the starting 11? Oh, cool deep, Yuzi. Mm. You know, Chahal's a, a, a one. You, you, you need mystery spin. You need right. spinners that can spin it either way. So, cool deep, Yadav is obviously uh, bowled beautifully. Uh, there's something about Ashwin as well. Ashwin's probably not going to get a mention, but I, I like the professor. We love him too. I like the professor. I, I I wouldn't rule him out being in the squad. Whether he plays all the time, I have to wait and see, but I wouldn't rule him out being in the squad because I think he's going to take Rajasthan quite a long way uh, in this year's IPL. I think Rajasthan are winning this year. Yeah. It'll be very... They usually bottle it at the end though, don't they? Avesh Khan, he stepped up this year. Mm. They've It'll... got a good team. They've got good Indian players in good form, but you want them in good form going into the eliminations. Fair. It's a bit early. Fair. Uh, lots more to unpack with you. I appreciate your time a lot. No problem. Uh, my inner child is very happy today. I'm getting to spend time with Michael Vaughan. <laughs> Huge day. Thank you. Lots of fun. Thank you, Michael. No problem. Thank you so much. That was the epic episode with Michael Vaughan. I'm always looking forward to these cricket episodes whenever I see them on my schedule. These are the ones that give me true joy. It speaks to my own inner child. Going to be continuing this entire series Lots more cricket legends coming up on TRS. Keep supporting us. 